Today we're going to look at some selected questions from a press. Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at some selected questions from a practice exam for Mathematics Extension 2. Not going to have a look at every single question because they're not all as interesting or as challenging and for the students of mine who attempted this practice exam, I'm going to focus on those questions that either have something interesting in the solution that is worth discussing or the ones where we had some major issues that are worth addressing in terms of like common mistakes and misconceptions. Okay, So you'll see as we go along through that I've highlighted the questions I want us to have a look at and uh, the very first one is is in multiple choice and it's question one. It says, what is the value of this definite integral from naught to two of the square root of x on four minus x with respect to x using this particular substitution and they provide for you x equals four sine squared theta. So here are all of the different options. Let's have a go and uh, see what emerges as we do our working. So I'm gonna put this to one side and uh, let's write down first, this is question one. Okay, now we'll begin just to write down the uh, particular um, substitution that they've given. It's x equals 4 sine squared theta. So we see these trigonometric substitutions all of the time. Um, as you know, when we have a think about a definite integral, there's really three things that need to be changed. Number one, we have to change the boundaries um, that we are going to be evaluating this integral within. You've got to um, fiddle with the integrand, the things being integrated. So we will substitute wherever we saw x, for instance, we will see, um, we'll replace it with a 4 sine squared theta. Uh, and then we also need to change the variable of integration. Integration. So we're going to need to know what dx on d theta is and that will change, you know, we used to be integrating with respect to x, then we'll be integrating with respect to theta. So what I'll do is just on the right hand side here, I'll put all of that sort of uh, ancillary working that will help me do the substitution. So to begin with, I'm actually going to think as I go from uh, left to right through my integral, I'm going to start with the boundaries, okay? So I'm going to go with x equals zero, that was the original boundary. What am I going to get for theta? Well, that's going to give me, well, for sine squared theta is equal to zero. Now you can see if I divide through by four, you get sine squared theta on the left-hand side and still zero on the right-hand side. And I want sine squared is equal to zero. Well, therefore sine theta is going to be equal to zero. And there's an obvious solution for sine theta equals zero. It's going to be theta equals zero, okay? Come back to that thought in a second. Let's have a look at the other boundary. That's x equals two. And uh, this makes a little clearer one of the primary issues that we want to drill down into. And that's why I'm doing this question as a demonstration uh, with using trigonometric substitutions for any kind of integral. Let's write out what we're going to get here. You got the four sine squared theta is equal to two because that's just the substitution for x divide through by four like I did previously, and now I take the square root of both sides. Now, unlike before, where we had sine theta is equal to zero, so neither positive nor negative, here I've got a half, and when you take the square root, I do have to deal with the positive and negative. We actually get plus or minus one on the square root of two. Now, when you've got this plus or minus, right, um, when you were first introduced to solving trigonometric equations, um, things like, you know, sine theta is equal to, uh, you know, root three on two, for instance, okay? One of the things you would say is, oh, which quadrants am I in? Or which, you know, am I looking at an acute angle, obtuse, reflex, etc." okay? Now, the nice thing uh, about this plus or minus is you kind of don't have to worry about which quadrants you're in because you're in all of them, right? If sine theta can be plus or minus one on root two, then you can have the base angle um, in, the, in the first quadrant, you can have that same ba base angle in the second quadrant, so the obtuse version, and then you've got the two reflex angles that go along with that. Now, that makes it easier to solve because you don't have to think about like am I in quadrants one and three or two and four that kind of thing but it makes it harder because in this case I actually want a single boundary value for theta right now I could write out fairly easily maybe you can think of the base angle for one on root two it's just going to be pi on four but it raises the question just like it did earlier on um, because theta equals zero is not the only solution to this equation up here it raises the big question about well why did i choose these boundaries if pi on four is a solution to uh, this equation right here then so is three pi on four and so is five pi on four and so is seven pi on four and all of those repeated uh, on and on and on for the rest of the sine function we will come back to that question a little bit later on when we come up with a solution, but I just want to flag that or sort of uh, put that post in the ground and have you thinking about why I, it is that I chose this particular value for theta for zero and for pi on four, okay? 
So, dealt with my boundaries. Um, I'm gonna deal with my integram when I just substitute all of the x's for four sine squared thetas, okay? Uh, and then the other thing, the third thing is the variable of integration, right? So as I mentioned before, I need to know what, oops, it is easy, uh, dx on d theta is. So it's just a straight differentiation here. So you can see here, I've got the four hanging out the front and then there's just a um, reasonably straightforward use of chain rule on this, right? It's sine theta squared. So that uh, four comes out the front, right? Uh, just the constant coefficient. I will multiply by the power squared um, and then I will reduce the power by one, which gives me sine theta to the power of one. And then that was the outside, now I've got to do the inside. So inside derivative, the inside function is sine. So the inside derivative is cos. So that gives me this. And I could write that as eight, but I'll, I think it's simple enough. I'll do that when I'm doing my substitution. Okay, so therefore, I've got all my pieces ready now. I'm going to write my integral from x equals zero to x equals two of the square root of, we've got x on four minus x, close my square root with respect to, that, to x. What's that going to be equal to? Well, let's change them one piece at a time. We've got new boundaries in theta. So instead of going naught to two, I've decided to go from naught to pi on four. Then I've got the big square root here and now I'm gonna shove in all my four sine squared thetas wherever I saw x's, which is in two spots. So I'm gonna get this first up on the numerator there and then on the denominator and you might be now seeing why um, they've given you, they've supplied this particular um, substitution. You're getting four minus four sine squared theta, which you can see is leaning towards a use of the Pythagorean identity. Worth pointing that out because, you know, had this question not been a multiple choice question, I mean, it's a fair bit of work, even for multiple choice, but had it not been multiple choice, like worth three marks, for instance, um, I think it would have been totally fair game, as you might know, in extension two, we expect you to be able to do uh, integration by substitution where the substitution is not provided, right? In extension one, we always tell you what to do, but in extension two, Two, we're like, hey, you know what? Sometimes you work it out. And I think this is one of those cases where you look down here at this denominator and you think, oh, can I do something that would give me nice canceling happening here with the Pythagorean identity? And that is indeed what's going to unfold shortly. Getting ahead of myself. Let's uh, close that square root there. And to replace that uh, dx there, I'm going to have the, uh, the eight sine theta cos theta here, d theta that I worked out when I differentiated. Okay, so that's just write that on the end, multiplied by eight sine theta, cos theta, d theta. All right, happy times. All the substitution has been done. Now we just need to tidy up this thing and see what emerges and evaluate because it is of course a definite integral. Let's have a look here. Um, before I can start to actually work out what the primitive is, there clearly is a lot of simplifying work to do here in the integrand. So when you have a look, um, you're gonna get, uh, this is four sine squared theta, uh, and then on the bottom here, this is gonna be four cos squared theta. Do you see that, right? So therefore, um, the fours are going to cancel and this sine squared over cos squared, when you take the square root, both of them have been squared. So therefore, I'm just gonna get sine theta on cos theta. Um, I could have just as easily have written that as tan, but looking at the rest of the integrand, I see that there's kind of no point because I'm about to do some convenient canceling for myself, right? You can see here, I've got the, uh, I'm just gonna grab it like so. I've got this eight sine theta cos theta hanging out on the end here. And so you can clearly see my cos thetas are going to cancel. And so while I'm at it, I'm going to, uh, you know, bring that eight out the front where it's easier to see. So I'll put that eight right there. I've now got a sine squared theta because you can see this sine and this sine combining. Um, and then I, I, that's all with respect to theta. So this is looking really good because as an extension one student, um, I've got double angle identities that can help me here, right? Um, I don't have to do this as a reverse uh, chain rule. I can say, oh, I know that this is going to be equal to, oopsie daisy, um, two sine squared theta is one minus cos two theta. Um, if you don't know your double angle identities well enough by this point, um, that is probably an indicator to you about practice. Like I wouldn't say go and memorize these and put a lot of effort into that. Um, I know them because I've used them a lot. So that's, that's what I would suggest here. Um, so from naught to pi and four, if you take out a factor of four, you get left with that two sine squared theta. So that leaves me with four outside of one minus cos two theta d theta. And I think at this point, I am actually ready to integrate. So um, big square brackets, um, I might as well pop that four out the front, it's not useful to me inside the integrand anymore. Um, the one is gonna integrate up into theta, remembering that's the variable integration, and then I'm gonna get, uh, let's see here, so um, 
minus cos is going to come from minus sine and also I'm going to divide through, I'm, I'm thinking about reverse chain rule here because of the, the two theta on the inside there. Uh, and that goes from naught to pi on four. Okay, looking good, let's go ahead and evaluate. Um, do my upper bound first, so four's out to the front. Um, you're putting your pi on four, that looks like it's gonna cancel nicely. Um, you're gonna get minus a half of sine two times pi on four, which of course is pi on two, and that's gonna simplify out because um, sine of pi on two is of course one. And then, having done the upper boundary, my lower boundary, zero here, zero there, sine zero is zero as well, so that's really convenient. I'm gonna be subtracting a big fat zero, okay? From there, what have I got? Well, four times pi on four, that just gives me pi. And then in here, what do we say? This is gonna be equal to one. So if I say this is equal to one, therefore I'm really just getting four times negative a half, which last I checked was minus two. And if you have a look back, let's just bring up that exam again, there it is. That's looking like option B for me. So I'm just gonna uh, write that like so. Ta-da, got my solution, okay? Now, just putting that back to one side, let's return to this issue here that I flagged about these particular boundaries and why I chose these ones and not other ones, right? Um, why did I know or how could I tell that, say, you know, uh, negative pi on four, like I, I actually went round um, in a positive direction, but uh, it's pretty easy to see, you know, if I put in sine theta equals negative one on root two, and if you just say, for example, blindly reach for your calculator and say, well, what's um, sine inverse of negative one on root two? It's gonna give you negative pi on four, and you might think, well, is that a valid answer? You know, why or why not? Now, it's pretty, um, let's put this in a different color. It's pretty clear to see what will happen if we, for example, um, consider what happens if we try using theta equals negative pi on four. So this is gonna be an illustration of how I can tell that this is not going to be a plausible answer and why I can somewhat dismiss it out of hand, right? If I try this out, um, everything that I did from here through my substitution through here, all of it's gonna be the same except this boundary is just gonna sit there as negative pi on four all the way through for some amount of time. So therefore, it really kind of kicks in at uh, this line here when I do the evaluation. That's when things are going to be really different. So let's see what happens if I actually put in negative pi on 4 instead of pi on 4, right? I'm going to have 4 of theta minus a half sine 2 theta, and I'm going to go from 0 to negative pi on 4. Noting that this is going to be backwards because negative pi on 4 is to the left of 0, but like you can't change it, like you can't just say, oh, I'd like to make it backwards because um, if you wanted to switch that order around, you'd have to switch these two around. Like you'd have to multiply through by a factor of negative one to indicate you were going along the interval backwards, right? So I'm gonna stick with this. And when you do the straight substitution, um, this should look familiar, right? You'll go four and then out the front, you'll have a negative pi on four and then minus a half of sine of negative pi on two. You'll still get zero on the end there because, let's just change that to a square, a square bracket, because um, we have not changed the lower boundary, it's still zero, and that's where I got this zero from in the first place, okay? Now, what you can see here, hopefully, is that number one, we flipped around the sine of the pi on four, it's negative pi on four, and because sine in here is <laughs> S-I-N, S-I-N-E really, because this is an odd function, flipping around the sign of the angle that you're supplying into it will flip around the sign of the whole function as well. So therefore, you're going to get negative pi plus two. So you have the exact opposite answer that you got from here. Now you might say, yeah, well, how did you know that that isn't valid, right? Um, and the key that I would suggest is remembering that pi is about 3.14, so this is minus 3.14, let's just write that as approximate approximately equal to minus 3.14 plus 2. So this is about negative 1.14. And I can immediately know without appealing to anything um, sort of really advanced or sophisticated, this can't be a plausible answer because this is negative. Now, how do I know the answer can't be negative? Look back to the original question. Here it is right here. If you investigate this integral, right? Have a think about this for a moment. Um, what is it that indicates to you, when you have a look at this, that a negative answer is completely unreasonable? And where my brain goes is, well, this is a square root function, right? Um, I am dealing with, thankfully, this is not complex analysis, this is calculus in, with real variables. So therefore, what's underneath this square root um, is gonna be real numbers. You're gonna get a positive number out of this. Um, and therefore, if you're only gonna get positive numbers out of this, your entire function has to stay above the x-axis. So therefore, whatever integral you take, its signed area 
will be positive. Remember, areas um, that we work out from integration can be positive and negative depending on where they are in relation to your horizontal axis. All of this is gonna be above, and so for this, therefore, this um, area that will be equivalent to this definite integral has to be positive. Um, and so that's why minus uh, negative pi plus two, that, that's clearly wrong, right? This is no good, no dice, okay? And just to illustrate this, right, what's actually going on here, here is what the square root of x on four minus x looks like, and the particular area that I'm asking for is this sort of black shaded thing in here. So this is how I can know, right? Even when you have a look at this point here, you're like, hey, hold on a second, this is gonna be negative, right? So therefore, that's one of the reasons why you can think this. Now I can understand why you might be a little dissatisfied with this um, argument, at least I was when I first came up with it, because you make this decision about which boundaries to choose long before you really have a clear sense of what that integrand is gonna look like and therefore what function you're going to be evaluating. So you'd be forgiven for thinking, yeah, but how did, how did you know that early on, right? Um, especially when you think about, well, once you do simplify what that integrand looks like, four times one minus cos two theta, 4 times 1 minus cos 2 theta is going to be a function that when you integrate it, because it's been raised up by one unit, normally you would think that cos sits between negative 1 and 1, it's range, right? When you add 1 to that, you shift it up to go from 0 to 2. Um, that coefficient of 4 out the front means it's not from 0 to 2, it'll be from 0 to 8, okay? Um, but the issue is going to be the same, that you're going to get positives everywhere. So how did I know, right? Now the, the plain fact of it is that there isn't, um, there isn't just a single pair of values, one for x equals 0 and one for x equals 2, that will give you the right answer. And that's really clear to see um, by thinking about this, what created this problem in the first place, right? The trigonometric trick function that we replace our original square root x minus four on x, four minus x function with, this function is periodic. So therefore, you can see over here on the left-hand side, shaded in blue, this is my naught to pi on four of this function that I created. So this blue area is equal to this black area. Sorry for my scale being a little bit off, but the reason why is because I wanted to show you over here, if you add two pi to both of the boundaries I chose, naught and pi on four, if you go two pi and nine pi on four, clearly they will give you that same area, the blue and the green, um, Areas there are identical, right? But it, it doesn't make sense to go and try and evaluate this because it's like, oh, gross. Like, why would you do that? You're gonna get an equivalent value over here. So just choose the ones that are convenient to you, okay? I guess what I'm trying to say is when you have a look back at a question like this, there are some clues like, you know, the fact that it's all gonna be positive that will skew you in the direction of saying, oh, I should just choose values that will give me positives, right? Um, but otherwise, you do have to reckon with the fact. It's kind of a, a chink in the armor of using trigonometric substitution that in fact, um, there isn't unambiguously one pair of boundaries that are the boundaries that make sense. There's just ones that are more convenient or less convenient and several of them will give us the right answer, but you have to be genuinely careful because others will give you the wrong one, right? Uh, it turns out, by the way, that part of the reason why this is wrong is not because negative pound four is just impossible, but because you would have to um, choose a, a different appropriate boundary for the x equals zero solution in order to go um, from left to right rather than from right to left. That's, that was the issue here, right? You went from zero to negative pi on four, so you're integrating backwards and that's what gave you this, um, this negative result, right? So, all that to say, you know, uh, trigonometric substitutions are a tool. They're not magical. They don't always give you the right answer. In the real world, you're going to just have all these tools in your toolbox and you just have to make choices about why you would choose one over the other um, and under what circumstances, you know, the tool is appropriate and, and you've got to be careful how you use them, okay?